in this next part of the course, today and immediately after the spring recess, I want to address the central programmatic themes of a progressive alternative. Not in any particular national context, as I have been doing uh, with European social democracy and the United States, but in their own right and as a general matter. And undoubtedly, the most important core of any progressive programmatic alternative has to do with the content of a progressive political economy. And I have said before and say again that what I regard as the central themes of such a progressive political economy are three contrasts. First, the relation of the backward to the advanced parts of production. That is, the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. And today, that general concern must be translated into a debate about the future of the present most advanced practice of production, which we call the knowledge economy. Will it be a knowledge economy for the few or for the many? And what is implied in the path from the insular knowledge economy of today to the socially inclusive knowledge economy that we should want? The other two themes seem to me to be, in a sense, subsidiary to this central contrast. But they are also important components of a progressive political economy. They are the relation of labor to capital and the relation of finance to the real economy or to the productive agenda of society. So that's what I intend to begin today and maybe to continue in the class immediately after the recess, the exploration of those three concerns of a progressive political economy. Now, it should be clear at the outset that the conception of a progressive alternative defined by engagement with these three themes uh, distinguishes itself from the prevailing contemporary ideas of the progressives in two main ways. The first way is that it requires structural, that is to say, institutional and ideological change. It involves a reshaping of the established institutional arrangements of the market order. Not necessarily or primarily the substitution of the market by something else, and particularly by the state, but the transformation of what the market is. And this idea that we could reshape the institutional form of the market order depends on assumptions that we've discussed earlier in the course. First, it depends on the assumption that a market order has no single natural and necessary form. And second, positively, it depends on the assumption that the most important thing that we can do with a market order is neither to regulate it on the one hand, nor to compensate for the inequalities that it generates as a motor of economic growth on the other hand, but to change it, 
that is to redefine its legal and institutional architecture in a way that influences the primary distribution of economic and educational advantage and disadvantage, rather than simply trying to correct that distribution after the fact, retrospective and compensatory redistribution through tax and transfer. That is to say, through progressive taxation and redistributive social spending or social entitlements. Everything that we can do to influence the primary distribution of advantage, the fundamental distribution, overshadows in significance, according to this premise, whatever we can achieve by way of retrospective correction, that is, whatever we can achieve by way of a derivative or secondary distribution of advantage and disadvantage. And the intuitive idea behind that proposition is that any attempt simply to correct the unequalizing effects of the operation of the market after the fact, corrective redistribution, establishes an inevitable tension between the logic of the established economic arrangements and incentives, the incentives to invest, to save, and to employ, and the objectives of the redistribution. So if the redistribution that we need by way of correction is massive, because there are massive inequalities anchored in the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, it is likely that this corrective redistribution, long before reaching the requisite level of magnitude, will begin to undermine those established economic arrangements and incentives and to exact an unacceptable economic cost. And that is the practical reason why corrective redistribution under the aegis of institutionally conservative social democracy merely attenuates inequality rather than reaching its structural causes in the organization of the economy. Now, the second way in which the progressive political economy have in mind, I have in mind contrasts with the conventional ideas of the progressives today is that it describes a productivist project. It is oriented to the supply side and not simply to the demand side of the economy. And overwhelmingly, the ideas of the, the, the economic ideas, the political economic ideas of the contemporary progressives are demand oriented. They, on the whole, abandon the supply side to the conservatives. And what they seek to do is then to correct the supply side in its consequences not in its legal and institutional architecture, to correct it through the compensatory redistribution to which I referred before. Now, that's just to set up the kind of argument I have in mind. And before I go any further, let me ask if you have any comment or question about these initial propositions. Okay, so the first theme, the first great theme, and I think the central theme of a progressive political economy 
has to do with the relation of the most advanced practice of production to the rest of the economy, to the vast economic periphery in which most people and most businesses remain caught. In every historical circumstance, there is a most advanced practice of production. The most advanced practice of production is not necessarily at the outset the most efficient practice, the one that achieves the most output with the fewest inputs. But it is the practice with the greatest potential to reach and to remain at the frontier of productivity. And above all, it is the practice with the greatest exemplary potential, the potential to inform, to guide, to inspire the transformation of the rest of the economy. The two greatest economists, the two greatest economic thinkers in the history of economics, Adam Smith and Karl Marx, both believed that the best way to understand the operation of an economy is to study the most advanced practice in the historical epoch in which we find ourselves. And for Adam Smith and Karl Marx, it was mechanized manufacturing, which turned into what we later called industrial mass production. Now, why did they believe this? What is the reason to think that the most advanced practice is the best way to understand the operation of the economy? I think that the explanation is that the most advanced practice is the practice that most fully reveals our powers, our creative powers, our powers of imagination, our powers to reshape the material world and to put on the material world the stamp of our spirit. That's the reason why the most advanced practice of production is the most rewarding, according to them, uh, in, in, its, in its study. Uh, it's there that we show our, our highest creative powers. And from the standpoint of today's most advanced practice of production, it seems that the distinguishing attribute is that it is a form of production that is close to the, the imagination. And I'm going to say something later more about what I mean by the imagination. So the most advanced practice of production has ceased to be conventional industry, industrial mass production, which we define as the large-scale production of standardized goods and services by rigid machines and production processes on the basis of semi-skilled labor and very hierarchical and very specialized relations of production with a, a, a stark contrast between the jobs of supervision or definition of the plan of production and the jobs of implementation. And then each of those jobs of implementation are in turn very specialized and very separated from one another. That was industrial mass production. Now we have this, the, the knowledge economy. And one country after another in the world is deindustrializing. Industrial mass production, the previous vanguard, is ceasing to be the vanguard. It survives 
as the vestige of an earlier vanguard, the leftover, or as a satellite, a sidekick to the new vanguard. It is increasingly outcompeted by the new vanguard. The new, the new vanguard of production produces better and more cheaply what it used to produce. And it remains competitive or feasible economically only by fleeing to parts of the world with lower returns to labor and lower tax takes. What then is the essential character of the new vanguard? Uh, it's common to associate it narrowly with high technology manufacture. And in the United States, especially with the platform oligopolies. But I think this is a misunderstanding of the nature of the new vanguard. In fact, as I'll say a little later, the platform oligopolies have a set of very special characteristics. And rather than being a revelation of the general character of the new vanguard, they are an anomaly. The new vanguard, in fact, is multi-sectoral. It exists in every sector of production. But in each sector, it exists largely as a fringe, an island, which excludes the vast majority of workers and of firms. How are we to understand its nature? So first, we could grasp its nature superficially at the level of the way in which it organizes production, the level of so-called production engineering or the technical division of labor. And at this level, the level that is most palpable or visible to the producers themselves, it has two sets of characteristics. One characteristic is that it combines production at scale with the destandardization of products and services. The destandardization of products and services was characteristic of craft production that preceded industrial mass production. And production of scale, of course, is characteristic of mass production. So this style of productive vanguardism combines attributes that before were separated. An attribute of craft production with an attribute of industrial mass production. Scale with destandardization. The second salient characteristic at the level of production engineering of this new vanguard is that it also combines a great decentralization of initiative in the process of production with the maintenance of coherence and momentum in the practice of production. So I think that the best way to understand this combination, as I suggested in an earlier class, is by a military analogy. It has the, the, the flexibility of an irregular force, a special operations brigade, or a guerrilla army undermining the rigid contrast between supervision and execution. But it combines that with the maintenance of hierarchy, momentum, cohesion 
in the process of production. And this is sometimes called, conventionally, the so-called Toyota method of production. Now, these are, as I say, the palpable and outward characteristics of this new productive vanguardism. It has, at the same time, deeper characteristics. But these deeper characteristics present a much more complicated problem. Because the knowledge economy, as it now exists, does not fully reveal these deeper characteristics. A practice of production develops and deepens. It reveals its potential only as it spreads across a wide range of economic life. And precisely because this form of production, this form of the of productive vanguardism has neither deepened nor spread, had remained confined in islands and fringes. Its revelation of these deeper characteristics is truncated. So it, there's, this, there, there's a promise which is unfulfilled. And what are the elements of this promise? of this incompletely developed nature that we see in the new vanguard. So first, there is a remarkable shift in the moral culture of production. And I'm, of course, going to exaggerate it in order to make it clearer. Industrial mass production, like the conventional form of the market economy, was based on the generalization of a modicum of trust, low trust among strangers. In fact, one way to define what a market economy is, a conventional market economy, is to say it's a form of simplified cooperation among strangers that is unnecessary when there is high trust and impossible when there is no trust. The classic European social theorists like Max Weber and Georg Simmel pointed out that the essential enabling moral circumstance for the new market order of the early modern European societies and thus as well of mechanized manufacturing and industrial mass production was the existence of a, a, a low threshold of trust among strangers. In most societies before in world history, there had been a very high level of trust to the insiders in your kinship group and your religion and whatever, and no trust to the stranger. And now there is a different world. It's a world of this cold, minimal trust generalized among strangers. Now, the momentous change to which I am referring in the moral culture of this new practice of production is that there is an elevation of the level of discretionary initiative and of reciprocal trust that is that are allowed and demanded of all participants in the process of production. So this system that I described in which there's much more decentralization, there's a, a softening of the contrast between supervision and execution. The plan of production is constantly reinvented in the process of being implemented. This depends on a heightening of the level of trust. 
the heightening of the level of trust is, as it were, the enabling moral circumstance that permits this productive experimentalism. Now, the second deeper attribute, un incompletely revealed, because incompletely developed in this productive vanguardism, is the approximation of productive activity to the activity of scientific discovery, and more generally to the imagination. Now, take a characteristic machine of this new style of production, what we call additive manufacturing, or uh, 3D fabrication. You have a, a, a machine that can instantly transform into something material, an idea that you have. And you can go back and forth very quickly between the conception and its materialization. And this dialectic, this interplay between conception and materialization is then what I mean by this bringing together of productive activity and imagination or discovery. Now, how are we to understand the imagination? So the imagination has two defining moves. One move was the move emphasized by Immanuel Kant, distancing from the phenomenon. So. What is an image? An image is the memory of a perception. And so you have to be away from it or after it in order to be able to imagine it. That's the first move. But most important is the second move of the imagination. The second move of the imagination is to subsume the phenomenon under a range of possible variations. And to have an idea about what that phenomenon can become, what it can next become as the result of certain provocations or interventions. That's what it means to imagine something to be able to rob it of its brute facticity, of its just thereness, and to place it in a larger context of adjacent possibles, what it can become next. And we could say, if, you, if you're not able to do that to a phenomenon, including a society, a whole society, you don't understand it. To understand something is just to understand what it can next become. And so a very general criticism of much of contemporary social science is that it doesn't do that. It is a kind of retrospective rationalization of the existent. It severs the link, the vital link, between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. So here in this new vanguardism, we have at least the promise or the potential for a form of production that is closer to the imagination. The best schools, the best firms become more like the best schools production becomes more like scientific experimentalism. And implied in this is the potential for a revolutionary transformation 
of the relation between people and machines. And so I mentioned this before, and I now come back to it in this context. What is a machine? And why do we have machines? What is the point of a machine? From this standpoint, you could say, the point of a machine is to do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat. Everything that we can express in an algorithm or in a formula, we can then embody in a physical contraption, the machine. So that we can preserve, we, the non-machines, the human beings, we, the anti-machines, we can preserve our supreme resource, and in a sense, our only resource, which is our time for the not yet repeatable. And then the combination of the machine and the anti-machine, the machine and the worker, can be immensely more powerful than either of them alone. But of course, this partnership between the machine and the anti-machine could be achieved only under a policy in which the state heavily encouraged the evolution of technology in a direction designed to enhance labor rather than to replace it. So we wouldn't think of the evolution of technology as some kind of natural force or exogenous. We would think of it as an object of deliberate intervention and reshaping in the light of this idea. So one of the many implications of such a view is that no, no one, no human being, should be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. Uh, this is incompatible with human freedom, with free labor. We should use machines so that we are not reduced to formulaic work. That's what they're for. And of course, the machines become more and more flexible. They outdo us in many characteristics, in computational power. But we can always run ahead of them, so long as we seek to preserve this relation between the machine and the imagination. Because although the machines may have more computational power than we do, what they do not have is imagination. That's us. Now I come to the third deeper characteristic of this productive vanguard conceived in this way. And this has to do with a mysterious phenomenon in economics, in political economy, which is the most lasting and universal constraint in economic life. The one that has the strongest claim to be considered a law of economics, if, if anything does, and which fascinated the pre-marginalist economists, but which they never understood. The marginalist economists from the late 19th century on simply disregarded it because their method didn't lead them to focus on it. This constraint is the, the so-called law of diminishing marginal return. What it means is this. If you hold constant the inputs to a certain product or process of production, and you increase or add one input holding the others constant, the returns to that input will characteristically rise 
plateau and then ultimately begin to fall at the margin. So the input will have a characteristic, make a characteristic contribution to production, which will eventually be exhausted. This is the law of diminishing marginal returns. And this is what I'm saying has the greatest claim to be considered a law. Now, no one has really been able to understand what is the basis of this law. And this, of course, isn't even a topic in contemporary economics, even though it was something that puzzled the pre-marginalist economists in the early 19th century and in the 18th century. What is the reason for this? So one way to understand it is the following. A new input, and in particular, an innovation. Let's think of a new input as an innovation. It is a discrete innovation imported into the process of production from the independent evolution of science and technology. We commit it to the process of production, and then it, it displays this effect described by the, by the, the so-called law of diminishing marginal returns. The returns increase. They plateau, and then ultimately they begin to fall at the margin. Why is that? That's because this kind of innovation is discontinuous or episodic. It consists of like a series of little bursts that achieve, their, that achieve and then exhaust their effect. So in this new vanguard, we have at least the potential, the promise, for a, a practice of innovation that is continuous rather than episodic. And that is, as it were, internal to the process of production. It's not just imported from the outside, from science and technology. Because, as I said before, in describing the second characteristic, the whole process of production is like a form of experimentalism. And to this extent, it is possible at least to imagine that this law, or this law-like constraint, could be loosened or even reversed and we would no longer have diminishing marginal returns. And that would be a revolutionary transformation. Now let me say a word about the, 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 the platform oligopolies, because they are often, I think, mistakenly identified with the knowledge economy when they are, in fact, an anomaly. So they have several characteristics. And let me cite four of their unique characteristics. So first, their value lies in the universality of their platforms, and not just their economic value to their owners or investors, but their social value, their value to society. If you broke them up, they would lose that value. So Facebook, whatever, if it, instead of one platform, there were 10 platforms, as the defenders of the application of antitrust to these platforms propose, the result would be the destruction of the value inherent in the universality or inclusiveness of the platform. 
The second characteristic is that they are able, because of their scale, their size, to absorb the very high costs of these technologies, the entrance costs. The third characteristic is the near zero marginal cost of adding someone to the platform, a customer, a client. You press a button, and without any additional investment, you've gained a new source of income, you as the owner or the investor. And the fourth characteristic is that they depend on an accidental feature of the law of intellectual property, a kind of loophole in which the entrepreneurs who invented these platforms discovered a way to make money out of people's data, unprotected by the law of intellectual property. So rather than the property being excludable in the categories of the economists, it's the opposite. It's a kind of non-excludability. So it's a business model that depends on the combination of all of these characteristics. That's not a good example of the knowledge economy. It is, in fact, an exception. The knowledge economy, I insist, exists now in every part of production, in every sector, including intellectually dense intellectual services, such as software, software as a service, and precision or scientific agriculture. In fact, one of the characteristics of economies in which this new vanguard emerges is the effacement of the contrast among sectors. The contrast among sectors of production is no longer as clear as it used to be. For example, High technology manufacture, in a sense, consists in crystallized intellectual services. That's what it's consistent. And many of the businesses in high tech manufacture are so-called fabless. They have no physical factories of their own. They subcontract. So that's then the reality. So that's an initial conception. Now give me just a minute and I'll be right back.
right, so I've said quite a lot, actually. Uh, and are there comments or questions about this initial statement? Yes. Sure. So, I mean, there's this question, right? Machines, the nature of machines is always changing. And now we have the experience of machines, for example, used for the translation of natural languages, in which it seems, according to some, that they skip the stage of generating rules of inference. So in the earlier generation of machines, you would say the machine has to have a formula or an algorithm and a way of inferring some things from other things. And these machines can go directly from big data to conclusions without the intermediate stage of the rules of inference. I don't think that that's exactly what I meant by imagination. By imagination, I meant this crucial process of first distancing and then subsuming the existent phenomenon under a range of adjacent possibles. That's what I'm taking to be the distinctive quality of the imagination, uh, uh, which is different from even this, these, as it were, non-inferential machines. But if we spoke again 20 years from now, we might have different machines and a different set of problems. And then we'd have to retake the conversation. But the general idea is that we run ahead of the machines. Because what are the machines? The machines are us yesterday. The machines are what we've already learned how to form. And what is then this characteristic of a being with imagination that we can go ahead in the periphery, in the penumbra, that we can, we can add something? So there's a race between the mind and the machine. That's the general idea. So it's not, as it were, a static thesis. It's a thesis about our, our, powers, of, our powers of advancement. And of course, it has to acknowledge that there are some things, notably computational power, in which manifestly the machines already exceed us exceed our capabilities. Yes. Speak louder, please. Of course. And then there's a, so one of the requirements for participation in the knowledge economy is a very high level of education. And not just a high level of education, but a particular kind of education that I'm going to describe later. So, you know, under, in, in classical development economics, by which I mean the development economics of the second half of the 20th century. Lip service was paid to education as one of the two so-called fundamentals. The other fundamental was institutions, by which they simply meant 
having a property regime that ensured investors of returns to their investment, and having a state, a mixed economy, regulatory state, with jobs for people like them, the development economists. That's what they meant. But the truth about industrial mass production with respect to education is that all, it, it in fact didn't require almost any education. What it required from the worker was elementary literacy and numeracy, sufficient to understand verbal and numerical instructions. Second, a disposition to obedience, dis discipline at work. And third, manual dexterity, especially in the form of hand-eye coordination. And so all this talk about education was superfluous in, in practice. That's no longer true to the extent that the worker is asked to work with numerically controlled machine tools that are continuously adjusted in the process of production. So it is a different reality. Yes? Well, that depends on the kind of education, right? So if, if the program of education is to mimic the encyclopedia, then the answer to your question is no. Because, but I don't think the program of education is to mimic the encyclopedia. So it's not as if the best student were the one who best managed to memorize the encyclopedia in many educational systems around the world, that's what the conception of the best student is. We, don't, we, we, we can't think that way under, under the aegis of these forms of social life that we're now seeking to understand. Yes? Of course they are. Sure they are. I mean, we're going to be discussing later the question of precarious labor in the contemporary economies. And then there's the issue of how the contemporary communication technologies can be used to organize and represent these decentralized independent workers. That's a very clear example. So we should have no prejudice about the ability to turn these things to practical effect. Yes? Yeah. Conventional industry. I mean, if the current system includes the knowledge economy, even in its truncated form, that's not quite true. Yes. Well, I mean, that's not a hypothesis. That's what happens. Toyota, ma the advanced way to manage a, a manufacturing firm that has converted to this partial form of vanguardism is to give a lot of space to workers. So work is organized by teams. 
not just isolated individuals with highly specialized functions. The teams have a great deal of discretion. And that's how production is organized. Now, of course, this is a, a trivialization of the idea because its main use is to motivate the workers. It's not part of a larger idea of the transformation of production, the role of imagination, but it, it's, it's a step in that direction already. So we're not talking about a fiction or a hypothesis. We're talking about the common practice now in advanced firms all over the world. That's how it is. And it does depend on an elevation of trust because it gives much more space to these production teams as it is. Yes, yes. No, so let's be clear. So what I'm saying is the productive vanguardism that we have is this insular vanguardism. Because it's insular, it's also relatively superficial. So these characteristics that I described are suggested, but not fully developed. Because my, my proposal is that we think that a practice of production deepens as it spreads. So its, it's dissemination and its deepening are two sides of the same process. If it is confined, it is not deepened. They're, those are the same things. So we're going to find relatively shallow and instrumental expressions of these attributes that I described. Uh, but I'm trying to understand this productive vanguardism in, in a large way. And there's no kind of techno-optimism which is implied in this. Because what I next would want to say is this insular vanguardism that we have, the vanguard as, a, as an archipelago of islands or fringes, is associated with a, a whole series of troubling phenomena. So one of those phenomena is what you could call hyper-insularity. So instead of the vanguard spreading, and therefore also deepening, uh, it retreats into an inner island. Because the people who control the commanding heights of the knowledge economy discover a way to divide, to bifurcate the process of production into two parts. The creative and profitable part they keep for themselves. And then the second part is the part they learn how to commoditize or to routinize. And those are the parts, or that is the part that they subcontract to firms and workers, often in remote parts of the world. So you can have 10,000 people in California keeping most of the money and having all of the fun, and then 100,000 slaves in China doing the commoditized part of that same process. So this is what I would call hyper-insularity. Hyper so it's the opposite of the deepening and the spreading. It's a perversion, and it's one of the characteristic perversions of this insular form of the knowledge economy. Now, a second characteristic that has to be emphasized is what you would call pseudo-vanguardism. So the vanguard, this vanguard, may at first seem to be much more widespread than it is. Because in order to sell its products and services, it has to educate the customers, the clients, in some of these technological capabilities. So, but that doesn't mean that the, the, the customers therefore become 
agents or members of the knowledge economy. So that's what I'm calling pseudo-vanguardism. The frontier around the vanguard seems to be porous because there are a lot of people who have the skills necessary to use the product or the service. That doesn't make them active participants in the knowledge economy. And the third and perhaps most troubling phenomenon of this insular form of the knowledge economy is then the consignment of labor uh, to uh, unstable employment. This is precarious labor, the so-called precariat. So the, the decline and disintegration of conventional industry was, was a, a momentous fact because it precipitated the dissolution of the middle part of the job structure, the world in which there was a stable employment force uh, assembled in large productive units like factories under the aegis of large businesses, corporations, with lifetime careers. It's that world which is being undermined and replaced by a world in which work is organized on the basis of precarious contractual arrangements a subcontracting to foreign firms to do routinized parts of the production process. So remember, Karl Marx, in the early chapters of Das Kapital, described the so-called putting out system. The capitalist uh, lends the machine, like the sewing machine, and gives the material to the worker the worker works at home with his family and friends in so-called mini factories. And then the capitalist does the piece work. That, that was the putting out system. What we think of as the normal form of the organization of production and of, of, of labor in fact, only had its heyday in a relatively brief period from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. It was preceded by several centuries in which work was organized on the basis of a decentralized network of contractual arrangements. Now, work is going to be beginning to be organized again on that basis. So we have what we could call a new putting out system on a global scale organized all over the world. And then this, this practice that we thought of as natural may turn out in retrospect to be a relatively brief interlude between the two long periods of this precarious putting out system. So all of this is part of the reality of the insularity of the, of, of the knowledge economy. It is what you, we could call a perversion, but it is the economic reality. And so we have to find a way to master it and to change it, to redirect it. That's one of the great themes of a progressive political economy. So, Any other comment or question? So, yes. Because of the dependence on natural resources, you mean? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think specifically on the productive practices of the early economy, they tend to depend for labor. 
Of course. I mean, there's this dependence. As I said, the, the, the earlier form doesn't disappear. Either if, when it's not a vestige, it is a satellite. So industrial mass production survives as a sidekick, as a satellite, as a component of the new process of production, organized now by new commanding heights. Uh, and one of the ways in which it survives is the way, the way you just described, of the extraction of certain natural resources necessary to the, to the new form. Uh, so all of that is true. But it's a fundamental transformation in the world situation. So the premise of conventional trade theory economies and developing or poor labor-intensive economies. That was the premise of the theory of international trade. And now we have a different situation in the world because this vanguard, this insular vanguard with all of its perversions, is present in all the major economies of the world in China, in Russia, in Brazil, in India, as well as in the United States, Germany, and Japan. So in a sense, the commanding force of the world economy has become this network of vanguards. And high finance is sort of a sideshow. It's not commanding. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a, a, a different situation from the situation that, that we had in the 20th century. Huh? Now, um, so you could ask, what is the basic reason for this insularity of the knowledge economy? Why is it insular? And it seems to me there are two different ways of thinking about it. So one way is it's insular because it has very special requirements that help explain its insularity. Unlike conventional mass production, it is not stereotypical. It doesn't consist in a small package of machines and skills that are easily transportable, like a kit that you can put in an airplane and take from one country to another. It's not stereotypical. And second, unlike conventional mass production, which had very forgiving requirements, presuppositions, educational, institutional, this form of production has very demanding requirements, we'll, as we'll examine later. So, it has, so this is one way of thinking about why it's insular. Now, there's another way of thinking about why it's insular. The reason why it's insular is that its insular form is what I called in earlier classes the path of least resistance. So there's an innovation in the world. And the most likely way in which that innovation is going to be established is in the form that least disturbs the dominant interests and the established preconceptions. So it doesn't take power and wealth away from the elites. It doesn't require the reimagination of the market order. And the insular knowledge economy then, according to this other way of thinking, is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance. It is the economic vanguardism reduced to its least disturbing, least subversive form. So that's on the question of the, of the causes of the insularity. Now, what about the consequences of the insularity? 
there are two large consequences. So the first consequence is economic stagnation, slowdown, slowdown of economic growth and slowdown of productivity. Now, there is a discussion in the United States that goes under the label secular stagnation, which is Alvin Hansen's label from the 1930s. And the claim is made that the slowdown is due is somehow natural. It's natural because the technological innovations of today are much less transformative than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. I can't understand that. To me, that's absurd. What, what could be more revolutionary than artificial intelligence, even conceptually? So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that there's a much more straightforward explanation of economic stagnation which is, how could there not be economic slowdown if the most advanced productive practice is denied to the vast majority of workers and of businesses in every major economy in the world? That's the cause of economic slowdown. So there you have a clear contrast of views of, 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 of explanation. Now, the second major consequence of this insularity of the knowledge economy is the aggravation of inequality. So inequality is now anchored in this hierarchical segmentation of the production system between the vanguards and everyone else. So there's the vanguard, and the people in the vanguard are, are creating wealth and having all this creative work and with lots of fun, lots of adventure, and lots of profit. Everyone else. And then they're surrounded by a bunch of paper pushers, financiers, investment bankers, management consultants, and so forth, who, who participate somehow in their gains. Everyone else in the economy is consigned to some form of make work. That's the fundamental reality. So, if, so, so the chasm between the vanguard and the rest has deepened. The distance between the vanguard and this vast economic periphery. And my claim then is going to be no amount of compensatory corrective redistribution can make up for that because that's a vast inequality. And the, the, the corrective redistribution would have to be massive in order to make up for that. It can't be massive. Corrective redistribution, you can't reinvent the whole economy at a second stage, at the stage of the compensatory redistribution. So uh, these are the two main consequences stagnation and inequality. Now, you could add a third consequence. And the third consequence is less tangible and has a more philosophical character. So Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes both believe two things. They believe that we're on the eve of overcoming scarcity. That's what Karl Marx said in the introduction to the critique of the Gotha program. It's what Keynes said in his essays on economic possibilities for our grandchildren. We're on the eve of overcoming scarcity. And when we overcome scarcity, we will be able to devote our lives, all of us, to our higher interests, to poetry, to art, to fishing, to whatever. We'll be a poet in the morning, and we'll fish in the afternoon, and so forth. This is what they say. 
because work is a hateful instrumental burden. So there are two ideas, that we're about to overcome scarcity, and that as a result, we can overcome the hateful burden of work. Now, what I think, by contrast to this idea, I think both these ideas are false. We're not about to overcome scarcity. Scarcity is endlessly reproduced in new forms. And second, it's not true that work has to be a hateful burden. Work can be a form of liberation. The closer it comes to the imagination. So both these ideas are false. And, uh, and so here is then the third element, I think, in understanding the tremendous consequences of this insularity of the new vanguard. We have here, in the, in the idea of the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy, the promise of freedom in the economy, and not just freedom from the economy. Marx and Keynes, when they thought of freedom in relation to the economy, thought there could only be freedom from the economy, from economic necessity. The question is whether, under the reign of scarcity, we can hope for freedom in the economy through the transformation of the market order and the deepening and dissemination of this new form of production. So that's the third debate. So stagnation, inequality, and freedom or the lack of it are the, are the consequences. Now, if you add this together, all this together, the speculation on the causes and on the consequences, of the insularity of the knowledge economy. You have a new dilemma in the world about economic growth. So the message of conventional development economics, this classical development economics, I said was the development economics of the second half of the 20th century. The message was, there's a shortcut to economic growth. The shortcut to economic growth is to take workers and resources from the less productive parts of the economy and put them into the more productive parts. And if you do that, and in practice it meant take them out of agriculture and put them into industry, that's what it meant. And the shortcut ultimately came up against the limits of the so-called fundamentals, education and institutions. But you could get very far by taking the shortcut. That was the message of classical development economics. Now, it stopped working. The shortcut doesn't work anymore. That's the problem. And the, the shortcut has been closed. The middle part of the job structure in these societies has collapsed. A larger part of the labor force is abandoned to radical economic insecurity, precarious employment. And the new vanguard appears in this insular, socially exclusive form, accompanied by all these perversions that I've described. That's the reality. Now, faced with this reality, the world is then presented with a fundamental dilemma. This is the dilemma that is beginning to preoccupy the whole world. <clears throat> the traditional formula of economic growth, so-called unconditional convergence to the richest economies, has stopped working. It no longer works. That's conventional industry. So conventional industry, conventional mass production is not coming back. The Rust Belt in the United States, for example, 
is not coming back. The most you can hope to do for it is to buy a few more years for its survival through this rear guard defense, subsidies, protection, and so forth. So, but what's the alternative to it? The alternative to it would be a socially inclusive form of the new vanguard of the knowledge economy. But that alternative doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in even the richest countries with the most educated populations. It doesn't exist in the United States or in Germany. How can you expect it to exist in the rest of the world? So the old, the, the old alternative, the old solution has failed. The new solution seems to be beyond reach. That's the dilemma. That's the dilemma that has to be solved. That's the fundamental problem of political economy today. And if the progressives have, are to have a project, their project has to provide an answer to that problem. Otherwise, it's no good. Now, so I think I should stop there and, and before, before going ahead and and ask for your comments and questions. Yes. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, not quite, I'm not following you. What are you saying? So they're saying no one would do this kind of work except for money. Uh, and uh, of course, if you're in the vanguard inventing things, that's very nice. Uh, but I don't know. Do the paper pushers have an activity of invention? They can invent these financial products. Maybe there's some secondary excitement that they get from that activity. I don't think it would convince very much the philosophers like Marx and, 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 and Keynes. So they would say that's a diminishment of humanity. And so there, there the issue arises of the difference between freedom from the economy and freedom in the economy. What do you think? So I don't want to go faster than I, than I need to go. I think we should, I, I, I want to be sure that we've considered these problems because I am going to present a view of how to go forward, of how to deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy, and then relate that to the other questions, labor and capital and finance and the real economy. But I think that a major part of this discussion is agreement about the problem. Because the correct diagnosis, the correct interpretation of the predicament is a large part of the thinking that, that, that's involved in this. Do we understand it correctly? And I'm presenting a particular view. Any comments? So it seems to me that this dilemma that I described can only be broken on one side, on the second side. There's the only way to imagine a solution to this problem, there's no way to, to give an afterlife to conventional industry. As I said, it's not coming back. 
And even though that's, uh, you could say, well, the conventional progressives apparently are trying to make it come back, or at least trying to buy a few more years for it. And paradoxically, like in the United States, where do the Democrats agree with plutocratic populism? They agree that it's worthwhile through subsidies and protection and so forth, keeping the air conditioning factory in Indiana or something like that. It's not serious. That's not, not, this isn't a solution for the, for the future. So the only way in which that dilemma can be addressed is on the second side. Okay. Finding a way to make the seemingly inaccessible, impossible objective of a knowledge economy for the many feasible. And then it would have to be broken up into parts, into little pieces, and into steps. Because real structural change in the world is fragmentary change, is gradual change. It can nevertheless be revolutionary if it persists in a certain direction. And that's the only way in which we could think of it. That we have to find a way to understand its components and to develop them. So for example, a knowledge economy for the many, unlike conventional industrialization, does require a very particular kind of education. What is it? And what are the practical conditions for providing it? And second and more significantly, a knowledge economy for the many requires a reshaping of the institutional arrangements that define the market economy. Now, it's nothing out of this world because we discussed before in the, in the United States the experience of the Americans in creating family-scale agriculture with entrepreneurial characteristics. They distributed the lands. They brought science, technology, and advanced practice to the local producer through the land-grant colleges and the system of agricultural extension. They secured agriculture against its peculiar combination of climate risk and price risk through agricultural insurance and food stockpiles and price supports. So they invented a kind of agricultural market that had never existed before. They didn't just regulate the agricultural market. Now we would need, one of the things that we would need to break this dilemma would be a 21st century industrial counterpart to this 19th century agricultural extension. So we need a different kind of education. We need a way of lifting up the rear guard. Uh, the vast economic periphery. And now part of the complication is it's not just the backward firms that have to be lifted up. So in all of these economies, there's a little vanguard of highly productive firms, and then there's a long tail of retrograde, regressives, especially small and medium-sized firms. And you have to bring advanced practice and technology to them according to their capabilities of, of assimilation and bring them closer to the vanguard. But that's not enough because in these economies there are also a, there's also a large part of the labor force that has attenuated relations to business organizations. So they're independent. They're in the situation I described as precarious. And so you have to go to their assistance, not as firms, but as individuals. 
Right? So take, for example, the nurse practitioner or the, 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 the machine repair person, technician. So you have to go to their assistants and do to them what you would do with the backward firms. You have to transform them into technologically equipped artisans. And this is a, a, on this view that I'm anticipating is a task of the state. It's a productivist task, not to replace the market, but to create a different kind of market. So somehow, by this combination of, invent of institutional inventions, we have to find a way to deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy, to begin creating a knowledge economy for the many, to replace the knowledge economy for the few that we have now, and to reinvent the market order. So it's, that's, a, that's a very tall order. Huh? But I think that it's nevertheless quite different in quality from the old Marxist idea of systemic change. Because it's not saying we have to take capitalism and replace it by, quote, socialism. It's not thinking that structural change is the replacement of one indivisible system by another. It's thinking that it's a trajectory, that it's a succession of steps. And these steps have to begin in the here and now with the material that we have given to us by the historical circumstance, and then go forward in a particular direction. So always in the, in the programmatic idea, the two most important features are to choose the direction and to define in the historical circumstance the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. And it's no different with respect to, this, to the problem of this dilemma that I just posed. So we have the spring recess now. And you have a whole week to think about this dilemma and its solution. And immediately after the recess, I'm going to assign the paper that, I won't, that everyone should do. And you're going to have five weeks to write it in. And the paper will be an engagement with the argument of the course. Uh, But I'm tired of the monologue, so I want to hear more of you uh, after the recess. And you'll have a, re a reason for engagement also because of, these, because of these papers. So have a good recess, and I'll see you afterwards. Now, wait a minute. We have, we have another 15 minutes. I always get confused because of this. Business of the cut up hours, okay. We have another 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to press ahead and state the, the beginning of an argument? Or do you, you have questions and propositions? Yes. Yes, James. Well, central planning is an ambiguous concept because central planning can mean discretionary allocation by a central authority. That's what we're avoiding. Huh? But planning can have another meaning, which is the conception of the direction. You need a conception of the direction. Now, it doesn't mean that, the, uh, that there's just one conception imposed by the ruler, by whoever has power. Because, combining this with the other line of argument, 
we can have in the society a dialectic, which there can, the society can go down a certain road, but hedge its bets, and allow parts of itself to diverge from the road and create counter models of the national future. So in very large terms now, in the argument here, it seems to me that the one axis is the democratization of the market economy. And the democratization of the market economy then has these three major focal points. Finance and its relation to the real economy, labor and capital, and above all, the rear guard and the vanguard. That's one focal point. Now, the counterpart to the democratization of the market economy is the deepening of democracy. So, an experimentalist disseminated knowledge economy has a much better chance of taking hold in a society in which the idea of engaging the framework and reshaping it bit by bit is part of everyday experience. And that's what democracy does. And so that's the whole idea of having then a form of democratic politics which is not ec ecstatic, which is not just an exception to the tenor of ordinary life. And then there are two other focal points which you can add to that. There's the formation of the individual who is educated, who is formed in a way which gives him a capability of agency and this power of imagination to resist, to engage in a way that also resists. So that when he engages in the social world, he can engage without surrendering. And he can be, as it were, an insider and an outsider at the same time. And the fourth focal point is then the organization of civil society outside the state and outside the market because organization is power. And social cohesion is generated from the multiplication of forms of collective action. So to me, those are the essential elements of a progressive alternative. And they apply all around the world. So I don't believe that there are rigid distinctions between the projects for rich countries and poor countries. They're all on a chain of analogies, of variations. And I don't believe in the idea of the present day progressives, that there's a universal orthodoxy combated by local heresies. I think that a universal orthodoxy must be combated by a universalizing heresy. And I want to present this argument that I'm giving here in the course as an example of a universalizing heresy. Uh, so that's the kind of argument that I'm making. Now, there's one other general way then to think about this, this, this project, this, this, this line of argument. And it uses these, these words that I referred to earlier, of the haven and the storm. So, Conventional social democracy was preoccupied with securing the individual in a haven of vital safeguards against private and public oppression and of capability ensuring endowments. That was the great achievement, for example, of European social democracy a high level of social entitlements, capability assuring social entitlements, paradoxically financed by the regressive taxation of consumption. And to this day, the attitude of the, of the progressives and of the social democrats is 
predominantly one of this protection against insecurity, against fear, against instability, against globalization, against markets. And I think that is a, that's a losing position, losing in philosophy, losing in politics. Uh, the force that commands the agenda always in history is the one that represents the cause of creative energy, of construction, of innovation. Where, and this is what the contemporary progressives see to the right. So, so that's one aspect of this end, of not having a productivist project of having a project that is oriented only to the demand or the consumption side of the economy. So I say, in response to the pro contemporary progressives, it's not enough to have a doctrine about the haven. We need to have a doctrine about the storm. The reason why we secure the individual in this haven of safeguards is so that he can stand up. and so that he can thrive and act and resist in the storm. And, but the storm does, isn't automatic. The storm has to be arranged. So all of these discussions about institutional alternatives are ultimately discussions about how to arrange the storm. So we do need the haven, but we need the haven as the counterpart to the storm. That's, that's the basic moral character of this idea. And uh, this, this more ambitious conception of what the alternative is for. Uh, so fundamental is the enhancement of agency, the ability of the individual as an agent to engage his context, but to resist it. But to do that, the context, the social world, has to be subject to some form of liquefaction. It can't be just there as a brute fact, which has to be accepted on a take it or leave it basis. Huh? And so that's why then there's these ideas about, and then the, the transformations that happen, like these innovations in which the knowledge economy consists are then the opportunities for the setting up of the storm. That's, that's the basic idea animating this argument. And it's, it's, it's uh, so we can relate it, what I said at the beginning of the course about the difference between the progressives and the conservatives. So remember, because this is also very important to an understanding of the purpose. So contemporary progressives think, think this is how they think of the ideological debate. It's shallow equality against shallow freedom, shallowness being the acceptance of the institutional arrangements. And who are the progressives? They're the ones who accord priority to equality against the background of the existing institutional arrangements. So, but if you combine the egalitarian profession of faith with the institutional conservatism or skepticism, the result of that addition is this commitment to corrective redistribution. And so the theories of justice are then the philosophical gloss on that operation. Huh? I'm saying that's not the way to think about the difference between the right and the left, the conservatives and the progressives. The way to think is there are two crucial differences. One is the progressives insist on going beyond the horizon of the established institutional arrangements. They're the ones who are unwilling to take the established form of democracy and of the market order 
as an unsurpassable horizon and persist in going beyond it. When they go beyond it, they don't think in the old way of the substitution of one indivisible system by another. They think that this structural change is by its very nature fragmentary. Now, the second difference between the progressives and the conservatives is that the conservatives think it's natural for human life to be small, except for an elite of entrepreneurs, heroes, visionaries, saints, or when there is some calamity, some national emergency like war, that lifts people out of the littleness of life. And the progressives should be the ones who think that it's not natural for human life to be small, and that we can become bigger together. So that's another part of the background to these ideas. So the, these ideas are all ideas about the enhancement of this power that we have together on, on production, on politics, through, through agency. And that goes way beyond the notion of the haven, the, the protection. Yes? How scarcity is reproduced in new forms, is that what you said? Yeah, so, I mean, there are different kinds of, there, so there's different kinds of scarcity, right? There's the, there's the, there's the elementary material scarcity, the scarcity of capital, the scarcity of material things. And then there are the more intangible kinds of scarcity, the scarcity for, of relative goods, like fame, recognition, being taken care of. And All of these scarcities are, they constantly exist in new forms. Uh, there's never enough. For example, just to take the intangible one, there's never enough recognition. There's never enough being together with the others. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in the English novel, the, a dominant architectural principle is the accumulation of things. So Robinson Crusoe on his island accumulates things. Why does he accumulate things? He accumulates things because accumulating things is a way of not depending on people. So material accumulation is an alternative to personal interdependence. And uh, that's a spiritual perversion because what do we all have? We all, in the end of the day, what we have is one another. And what we want of one another is unlimited scarcity, a form of scarcity. So what does one human being ask another? He asks him, is there an unconditional place for me in the world? And can he ever receive a completely satisfactory answer to that question, even from his lover? No, he can't. And so this is the nature of humanity. And uh, uh, this is given who we are. Uh, and so there's no, there's, there's never enough, there's no limit, and I think that's part of the situation. Huh? Uh, so we desire more and more things. What we desire, our desire even for material things is unlimited because the material things are proxies 
for the unlimited ones. And uh, nothing is going to cure 